Good afternoon and welcome to our dis a discussion today. My name is Tabang Chilwane. I am the executive head of uh, Group Strategic Relations and Public Affairs at NetBank. And your host for this session, along with uh, Mr. Chris Yelland, Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence. Before I start, allow me to share with you a powerful quote I had recently. Sometimes change will not be given to you. You must ask for it, says Sipo Koza. Now, who is Sipo Koza? Sipo Koza is a taxi driver. Now, let me say that quote again. Sometimes change will not be given to you. You must ask for it. So in lieu of yesterday's uh, taxi protest, if you are in South Africa, you'll understand the issue and us wanting to ask for change today. In the preceding energy dialogues hosted by NetBank alongside with EE Business Intelligence and the Johannesburg Center for Software in Engineering at Vet University, experts and energy stakeholders discussed the various ways to decentralize the nature of energy system through renewable projects and low carbon technologies that foster greater community inclusion. Experts um, attending our dialogues and in other forums have included among their viable intervention the rapid progression in more affordable battery storage technologies. It is uh, encouraging that tech, uh, ESCOM is uh, responding to this call for battery storage technologies to be added to our energy mix and working with the stakeholders who are committed to building a more flexible and reliable energy generation system that South Africa deserves. We might all know the context. ESCOM has flouted a tender for what will be so far the biggest battery energy storage system, BESS, in South Africa. The system will be located at the Scapflay substation in Friedendal, where ESCOM's 100 megawatts wind farm is located. ESCOM has already indicated the intention to award the contract by the end of 2020 and has publicly announced that the financing of the project is already in place. Scapflay project represents ESCOM's first large scale battery energy storage system project. The plan is seen by commenta commentators as part of plans to diversify the country's energy mix away from coal, which is used for about 85% of the country's power energy. At, the, at our last energy dialogue, ESCOM CEO Andre Dereiter um, told us that the public utility is specifically considering green funding to offset debt and to repurpose coal plants. It is in this context that we have invited the esteemed panel to discuss energy storage and flexible en uh, generation to support variable renewable energy, diversification, grid services, and resilience in South Africa. Without further ado, allow me to hand over to Mr. Chris Yelland, who will introduce our panel of speakers today. Over to you, Chris. Uh, hi there, uh, everybody, and a big welcome to our presenters today. Uh, that is Clyde Melanson, Crescent Mishwana, Frederick Verdal, and Alessandro Sessa, uh, who I believe are going to give you a well-balanced overview of the matters at hand today uh, concerning the subject uh, at hand, which is energy storage and flexible generation to support variable renewable energy, diversification, grid services, and resilience in South Africa. In looking at this subject, one must acknowledge the enormous strides that have been made in battery energy storage in terms of price, power output, storage capacity, energy density, and indeed delivery time. However, one must also acknowledge the very wide variety of battery energy storage technologies 
that exist out there. And there are all different kinds of chemistries. Uh, there are applications for stationary uh, application as well as for mobile application. Uh, there are vanadium flow batteries. Uh, there are lithium ion batteries. Uh, and it's still a highly contested area. Uh, and we're not sure uh, which technologies will emerge as the leaders. But I think it's true to say that in fact there are different horses for different courses. Some technologies will be suited to certain applications. Uh, some chemistries will be suited to other applications. Uh, so it's a very fast and dynamic uh, world of battery energy storage. But furthermore, we must also acknowledge that there are many other energy storage technologies and not just battery energy storage. So for example, we have pumped storage and, and, and Eskom already has very significant installed capacity of close on 3000 megawatts of uh, installed capacity of pumped energy storage, uh, pumped water storage uh, schemes. There's also a new uh, a concept, well, it's not that new, but it's uh, under development, and that is underground pumped water storage, where mines uh, who are involved with significant dewatering activities uh, can generate electricity uh, by uh, allowing that water to flow down the shaft into a bottom da dam that already exists uh, in, in, the, in the mine and then pumping it up uh, to uh, storage facilities underground uh, in, in the mining environment. Uh, and this underground pump storage uh, uh, schemes hold enormous uh, potential for South Africa, which has some of the most exciting uh, installation opportunities with our, high, uh, our deep level uh, gold mines, uh, which provide a very high uh, head of water uh, and, and therefore relatively lower consumption of water uh, to generate a certain amount of electricity. So a typical underground pumped water storage scheme could typically be 300 megawatts uh, on, and one shaft of a, of a, of a gold mine, uh, which is similar in, in size, in fact, uh, uh, to one of the units uh, at, at, at the Angula pumped water storage scheme that Eskom has, uh, which has a a dam above the ground and a dam uh, at the bottom of the mountain and a dam at the top of the mountain. Uh, and, and by using these underground uh, pump storage schemes, one can save a lot of money because the, the storage dams effectively exist already. But there are also other technologies, super capacity, super capacitor, flywheel, and of course, gas storage. Uh, is this a gas uh, is essentially a storage um, vehicle for, uh, uh, for energy. Uh, and can be used to generate electricity at the right time, at the right place, exactly uh, when needed. Uh, and of course, there's the future hydrogen economy uh, where uh, one could overbuild renewable energy plants significantly. And when there's excess uh, electricity being generated, can be used to, ge to create, generate hydrogen, which can be stored and used for a whole lot of applications, including power generation, but also industry, uh, heating uh, elec uh, vehicles, electric vehicles, and other applications. So uh, we're in a very exciting phase uh, with all these different um, uh, technologies out there. Uh, and one must also acknowledge uh, that, in fact, uh, the business case uh, for battery and energy storage and energy storage in general uh, is really becoming exciting. So take, for example, battery energy storage uh, the, of course, uh, the, the application that uh, obviously presents itself is to back up renewable, variable renewable energy, but there are also many other applications for battery storage which can be used, uh, delivered simultaneously, including frequency regulation, voltage regulation, black start, uh, emergency power, uh, and all kinds of other uh, benefits, uh, deferment of capital expenditure, by placing battery storage at the right place within the power system. And if you look at these stacked benefits, uh, each of which has a revenue stream, uh, the business case for battery storage is starting to become a no brainer. And we're going to hear more about it uh, th uh, this morning. So at this point, I'd like to introduce uh, to you uh, Frederick Verdal. Uh, Frederick Verdal is a senior power engineer at the World Bank. He's based in Pretoria, where he's managing the South Africa and Lesotho energy portfolios. Before this, he managed large infrastructure investment projects like the Inga hydropower plant rehabilitation in the DRC and the Haiti post-earthquake energy infrastructure reconstruction. Prior to the World Bank, he was at the French power utility 
EDF or Electricity de France, successively as head of the R&D research on EU gas markets, as well as head of the French island's power systems operation and planning. Frederick holds a nuclear engineering degree and a systems optimization master's degree from the Paris School uh, of Mines. And I cannot think of anybody better uh, to introduce this topic to us uh, than Frederick. So Frederick, over to you now. I hope you can see the first slide of your presentation. Uh, please let me know when I should change the slides. Thank you, Chris. I can see the slides. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, and it's my pleasure to, to participate to this uh, to this uh, uh, panel. Um, and then I'm very excited, actually, to 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 talk about the, the fastest growing uh, clean uh, technology, in my view. Uh, so sorry for the the solar guys on the on the call, but uh, for me, uh, battery storage is is the fastest growing in terms of technical progress, cost decline, and and scale of the market uh, scale increase. So the overview, next slide please. So overview of my uh, uh, presentation, basically I will uh, present uh, what the World Bank is, is doing about uh, battery storage. And then uh, uh, as you will see, we try to remain technology agnostic because as uh, Chris said, there is many technologies for many applications. Uh, and then uh, I will specifically uh, talk about the South Africa uh, case uh, for battery storage and, and, and what, uh, what the potential is there. Uh, then uh, I will talk about the ESCOM battery storage as a partner of ESCOM. So it's a little bit uh, uncomfortable to talk about uh, somebody else's project, but, uh, but uh, because we are partners, we we basically develop it together, so so we are all uh, together in this. Uh, and then a few uh, key messages as takeaway. Next, please. So next, please. Um, so first of all, uh, what happened uh, since uh, since uh, the World Bank uh, uh, first uh, uh, announced uh, its interest to to support battery storage worldwide? Uh, as you know, at the UN uh, uh, General Assembly in 2018, the World Bank committed to support uh, the battery storage development uh, with uh, uh, 1 billion uh, US dollars financing uh, for, for, for its uh, 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 client countries and to leverage uh, uh, private sector and, 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 and funds from the market uh, up to 4 billion uh, US dollars. So, but as a this uh, this map is to show that uh, basically three things. One, first of all, is on, on top right. The, the World Bank before this announcement was already doing battery storage investment uh, in mini grids mostly. And then it was uh, it was a uh, very small systems, but uh, but we, tr we we actually gained a lot of feedback and experience from that to scale up. Second important message on this uh, uh, presentation on this uh, uh, slide is that um, um, basically the, the, the current status is that uh, we are not talking much, but we are working, <laughs> meaning that uh, all the client uh, countries and utilities and, and public sectors that, uh, that actually is uh, looking for uh, concessional financing and support in order to prepare or to implement battery projects we are there and we, we, we respond present. Uh, as, a, as a result, uh, today we have uh, the project in green uh, as approved project on the bank side and the project in, in blue as a pipeline meaning under preparation. Um, uh, it's third, third aspect uh, that is also uh, important. Uh, most of these projects basically are linked to solar and wind projects. So basically the batteries are there to to, for the main application now, which is uh, uh, via reintegration into the grids. Uh, but there are also some other interesting applications and we will discuss it uh, about resilience, about uh, uh, grid investment deferral, about the frequency modulation, and interestingly about uh, support to interconnections to in enhance energy trade in, in power pools. So all these applications make it very interesting 
ma makes the battery uh, technology very interesting. And fourth on this slide, and the, the most important one maybe, uh, the in 2017, if I showed you the, the, the same map, there would have been only the South Africa uh, uh, ESCOM project, meaning that even before the World Bank formally committed to develop battery storage, the World Bank approved its first project in South Africa. And, and for that, because it's a pioneer project, uh, it's, it's for us a flagship and, 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 and uh, there is a lot of uh, visibility and attention inside the bank but also on the World Bank uh, 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 funders on this. Next, please. So one of the main uh, outcome of, uh, of our, our, our huge impulse on, on battery storage technology since the last two years was the creation of what we call the Energy Storage Partnership. It's basically a platform where all public entity on research, regulation, uh, environment and technical are gathering regularly in order to, to exchange views, to share practices, good or bad. That's why in the title I didn't say good practices. We share also the, the ones that we should not replicate, so we share everything. And also sharing uh, different work. We, we You see that we, we separated the work into streams. Mm -hmm. So how important it is, it's basically a team of of uh, five people in, in, in Washington uh, managing the partnership and also all the, the, the bank staff like me who are basically in linkaging and linking with, uh, with the field and with, with the different uh, uh, opportunities in the different countries. You will notice that uh, South Africa is well represented because uh, the South Africa Energy Storage Association and the CSIR are actually active members of this partnership and then you will you will notice also that uh, that um, uh, there is a, a, a lot of uh, other uh, uh, activities that where we actually invite uh, other members for instance on the training activity ESCOM is participating to what we call the, the battery academia where we do a lot of technical webinars in order to exchange practices between utilities, for instance. So it's a good knowledge exchange platform. Uh, it's working pretty well so far. We certainly will scale it up. Uh, coincidentally, today is, uh, is the first day of the, of the uh, 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 annual meeting. Uh, actually, they have two meetings per year, but this one is the most important one. So all the partners, the 36 partners that you see here, are Actually, this afternoon we'll, we'll, we'll gather and discuss. So it's pretty interesting. And then we, we, we expect this to actually accelerate the agenda in several countries. Next, please. So one other outcome is, uh, is, uh, is the work uh, yeah. that we are doing at the World Bank. Thanks to, to, to our global footprint, we, we can gather knowledge from here and there and share this knowledge. Um, and obviously, we on battery storage, we are very, very eager to do that. Uh, I put there just a, a, a few publications that we did on, on batteries. There is many more on the on the link that you see on the site. And then and then, of course, it's part of this spirit of exchanging knowledge. Um, we will discuss it in the in the q a but one particularity of the storage technology and and dynamics is that uh, it's evolving faster than the different uh, countries who would like to do storage are, are trying are, are able to to catch up and prepare the ground meaning for instance on regulation well right now there are countries who say we don't have time to prepare a regulatory framework because uh, the investment is at the door, so we will do regulation by contract. So this will be an interesting discussion. I hope we will be able to discuss it. Next, please. So yes, in South Africa, uh, why now and why battery storage now? So this is an interesting time. And then let's see uh, on, 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 on the World Bank side how we see uh, the, this, this topic from, from our window. Next. 
So first of all, well, I should have titled this, uh, this is not a test, meaning that the, the test phase uh, has been passed already. Uh, 12 years ago, I was actually testing sodium sulfur batteries in, in, in French islands, uh, but it was very, very ex well, small experiment in order to to see how storage can 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 apply. And then battery was very expensive at the time. It was a uh, three million euro per megawatt, something like this. So so right now uh, it's commercially viable almost everywhere, and it is uh, scaling up, meaning the the size of each individual system is is increasing. So when you add to that uh, the the cost of uh, wind and solar decreasing and the different grids modernizing, the battery storage makes it a, a very interesting tool. Um, so you can see in the different uh, applications, I, I picked just a few ones in order to, to show the, the diversity of different uh, uh, things that, uh, that battery systems could do and are doing already. Um, the interesting part is that uh, uh, obviously uh, the northern hemisphere is, is more advanced into the applications and, and, and operation of it. But uh, if you look at, uh, let's say, the number of different applications, the diversity is on the southern hemisphere. So it will be interesting to, to see business models that do not apply to OECD countries, but uh, are really, really a good fit in, in Africa, South America, Asia. Um, next, please. So on the post-COVID uh, situation, basically um, what we see, if, if I make a parallel with, uh, uh, combat, yes, if I make a parallel to the, to the, to the latest uh, post-crisis recovery, you know, after the financial crisis 2009, 2010, uh, if I recall well, South Africa uh, was uh, also recovering and then there, there were some hiccups on the power system, like now. Uh, and at that time, uh, there has been a, a certain uh, 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 need, let's say, for backup uh, supply, backup generation, for resilience of the and, and, and reliability of the supply for, for the business to grow. So if you do the parallel with today, obviously, uh, the diesel gensets of the, the, the of 10 years ago becomes uh, the battery system behind the meter today. Um, I, if I am a, a, a commercial entity today, definitely if I if I want to let's say enhance or pass my uh, ensure that I will grow after the, the this crisis and during the recovery, and want to avoid the hiccups of. Uh, so energy transition and modernization, I will consider investing in battery storage. So that's interesting times for battery storage, uh, grid scale and behind the meter. And then you can see that every one of these uh, little uh, bubbles here actually can benefit from energy storage at some point. Uh, like, like Chris said, of course, some of them are already there, pumped hydro, uh, there is potential for, for other type of uh, you know, site-specific energy storage. The beauty of battery storage is that it's modular. It can be anywhere. It can be uh, at any scale and it can move. Basically, if you don't need it anymore in Western Cape, you can move it to Eastern Cape. So that's, that's, a, that's an interesting asset. Um, so basically, in summary on this slide, to the best tool to, to boost the economy, you know, is to not only to see how you can have a, a reliable ele electricity supply for your economy to grow, to grow, but also to to find the, the the markets that are on the rise, the high growth potential markets, and then for these both reasons, uh, battery storage is a, is a tick the box. Next, please. While while it's moving, the 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 next slide is on the, the value chain potential. Uh, yes, thank you. 
So the value chain potential is tremendous worldwide, as you can see. In South Africa, it's even more. Uh, my friends in Bolivia and Chile will, will may not agree with me, but I firmly believe that South Africa is the best positioned country to have uh, a development on each of these segments of this battery value chain. And, uh, and then because of that, uh, definitely there is, a, there is something to do. What is at stake here is that uh, the market, you know, the number of batteries in operation in South Africa will create the spin and drive the, the value chain creation. So this is uh, maybe a bit off topic for today, but definitely this is something that we at the World Bank will look at very closely. Next, please. So very quickly on ESCOM battery storage. Uh, next. First thing is that uh, this uh, program, because it's a program, not a, a project, meaning that it's a multi-site battery program. Uh, this program uh, basically is a pilot. A, the, the initial idea that ESCOM had in 2017 was to demonstrate the viability of energy storage technology and many technologies, not only one, to uh, help integrating the viable renewable energy uh, that was already on the grid and that was coming. So for this reason, it was not designed uh, with a commercial purpose. And, and by the way, for, for our NetBank colleagues and also other commercial banks, when, when we sounded the financial sector in 2017 before committing with ESCOM to, to, to be one of the funders of this program, uh, basically three years ago, the financial sector, not only in South Africa, but also in South Africa, told us, well, you know, it's a bit too early. Uh, a first of a kind in, in one system like this one, we would prefer to, to see concessional funding coming and, and unlocking the, the market. Um, basically, it's, it's what this project did. Uh, not only it, we hope that it will demonstrate its uh, use for integration of renewables, but it, it's also uh, aiming to, to create what we call the enabling environment. So basically all the building bricks that would be needed for, for the scale up on environment, regulation, uh, grid codes, uh, uh, also market analysis, because we did with ESCOM a lot of market analysis and, and uh, from the manufacturer abroad to um, the, the different value chain uh, up to uh, down to the, the, the South African port. So basically all this work will be useful at some point for the battery storage market in South Africa. So the numbers here are just estimates, but basically it says that uh, it is a big demonstration pro project that will help ESCOM to learn about this technology for, for them also to, to be able to, to prescribe it in the future. For instance, when there will be private sector connecting to ESCOM grids and, and willing to use battery storage, ESCOM will know better what they can expect. So that's, that's uh, uh, let's say, part of the learning phase and the modernization of South African grids. Next, please. So the expected benefits, I, I touched upon it already, but uh, Basically for ESCOM is, is to use the techno and scale it up uh, for, for, the, for the country. Definitely the spin that it will create, uh, we hope we create a, a, a market uh, that will be self-sustained. And then you will notice that uh, basically like a lot of other countries, huh, there have been no ex ante incentives for, for the, the market to develop but there is already willingness on the private sector side to, to have batteries uh, grid scale or off grid. So meaning that there is for, for a couple of years or more, a business case already for batteries in South Africa. And, uh, and then uh, the other African utilities show a lot of interest to the ESCOM program. Uh, most of them want to discuss and exchange with ESCOM and take and benefit from their feedback. Uh, Kenjan in Kenya, who have uh, 
basically stranded geothermal energy that would like to use batteries. So a lot of uh, utilities would uh, be very eager to learn from South Africa, and this is a good thing. Uh, it means that uh, that uh, we are at the forefront of uh, of the development of this technology. Next, please. So I think the next one is just my concluding remarks. Um, basically, um, very quickly on my concluding remarks, um, on the World Bank side, we will continue to, to, to develop and to, to support battery storage development in, in countries uh, where there is a niche in island systems that I know very well, but also in fragile economies and fragile power systems. Um, one comment on South Africa, uh, what we noticed is that uh, battery storage uh, makes consensus across the board, meaning that uh, from the mining entities to, to, the, to, to the, the, other, all the other different generation technologies, most all of them actually uh, say that battery storage would, would be a plus in South Africa. So that's a, that's a good signal that this technology can can move forward now. So the, the point is to accompany it. Uh, ESCOM program is already uh, showing results in terms of value chain uh, and in terms of uh, of uh, you know grid codes and environment. And last comment, uh, there will be a need for an, an integrated value chain strategy in the country. Uh, some actors have started to work on this, uh, DTI and others. It may be needed to actually uh, have very, very soon something much more integrated. So over to you, Chris, and I'm waiting for questions. Thank you. I would now like to introduce our next presenter. Clyde Mallinson is an energy consultant and over the past decade has focused on renewable energy and storage technologies. Before this, he was the founder member, owner and analyst for two unit trust funds listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, the Earth Exploration Fund and the Earth Energy Fund. Prior to this, he consulted mainly to the resources industry in ore resource evaluation and techno-economics of mineral resources. He was head of department of the Geographic Information Systems and Remote Sensing at Fort Hare University. Uh, and also he was a lecturer at the Rhodes University in the Geology Department. So with that, uh, I'd now like to hand over to Clyde and we look forward to your presentation. Clyde, over to you. So I'm talking about the next decade, what's in store? And uh, boy, there's a lot in store for us, both from a climate change point of view and from excitement about where the energy sector is going. But when we're looking at something like this, we should never forget that uh, our, our Earth on which we all live is traveling as an almost unrecognizable form at the moment. And I think this painting by the Danish artist Nolder captures for me what we've been experiencing in the last couple of years. Fires in the Amazon, fires in Australia. Uh, the painting almost looks like a model of a COVID uh, virus. So we, we, we're having a really rough time and I'm hoping that at least in the energy supply sector, we can have some uh, light at the end of this very dark decade tunnel. So I'm going to kick off with just looking at South Africa's annual demand profile in 2019 that goes through from uh, the, the summer months January through to the summer again remember this is 2019 remember what happened in early December we had stage six load shedding um, uh, but that's what our profile looks like now our IRP our IRP says that's what we're going to be using in 2050 it's a linear projection I've just taken the current profile projected it to 2050 and it's 1.4 times as much as we currently use. And I want to show you that this kind of projection of taking the present and projecting it into the future in the current electricity supply industry has very little meaning. So pardon me now if I add on 10 gigawatts of nuclear, 
and I'm just putting it there as a base load. It could be a brand new 10 gigawatts of coal if Madupi, if it could be Madupi. I put that in, and the effect of that is to lower the 2050 demand profile. That's what base load does. Is it just it lowers that complexity, and effectively, if I then remove the nuclear, uh, we back to our demand profile for 2019. So, so base load doesn't help at all with the complexity of the actual demand profile. It just lowers that whole profile. Now we've heard, and in fact, this is what this is what I predict the profile will look like in 2050. So in 2050, that will be the generation profile. You can see the 2019 and the 2050 RP predicted uh, demand profiles down the bottom there. And we will adapt our demand to fit to that generation profile. So that middle strip is where we will be drawing demand and the bit sticking out the bottom will be pretty much going into storage and the bit sticking out, uh, sorry, out the top and the bit sticking out the bottom will be where storage comes into play to supply that new demand curve. And I think you'll all agree it's a very different looking scenario to the one that we're currently involved in. So if we just go and home in on where we sit at the moment, this is 2020, and I've shown this before in a previous webinar, we've got a shortage of energy. We're having to run gas, open cycle gas turbines very frequently. We've got a shortage of power, and we've got a shortage of flexibility. And it's very interesting to note that if we added immediately three gigawatts of solar, two gigawatts of wind, and four gigawatt hours of storage, the situation would look as follows. And you can see there that the, the white bits at the top here, which were load shedding, have disappeared. And we virtually, well, not virtually, we're not using open cycle gas turbines at all. Now, I'll just put this slide up because I want you to remember these numbers, three, two, and four gigawatt hours. Let's convert that to one gigawatt, say, of storage. Now we've heard about the capex reduction costs in, in, in wind. This is plotted over two decades. The first decade is the last decade, and that's where the curve is a solid line. The dashed line is a continued projection of those price reductions through to 2030. That's uh, wind. This is solar PV. And I think the last speaker said apologies to solar PV. This is battery energy storage. And you can see that it has the most dramatic cost reduction of the three going forward. Now, it's very important to actually plot this data on a logarithmic scale, and you get virtually perfect straight lines. I want to just say up front that I, I put in perfect data here, which is a reflection of what's happened over the last 10 years. So the actual data will be a little bit uh, away from those exact straight lines, but you can project it with those lines. And if we project through to 2030, we can see the full capital cost of wind is going to be about $700 a kilowatt. Solar is going to have dropped to 250 and battery energy storage. I must stress this is just the, uh, the, the DC battery pack in this case. And I'm using lithium iron here simply because there's lots of data on it and we can go back 10 years and we can project forward 10 years quite comfortably. Many of the other uh, uh, innovative storage technologies that many people are looking at don't have that kind of data set. So this is 2019, uh, call it 2020, but I've got a full data set for 2019 and we used about 231 terawatt hours in South Africa. That's our total demand. Now, a question that's been asked by some is, can we go 100% wind, solar and storage by 2030? And this is a theoretical question. I don't want to talk about how we would transition to that. I just want to see if it's possible. If we could sweep everything away and replace it with uh, wind, solar and storage by 2030, would we be able to supply our needs? Uh, this is a study done by Rethink X in America. They looked at California, Texas, New England, and I've added South Africa to that. And I want to compare us to California. So they 285 terawatt hours, we 231. The average hourly demand is 32.5. We're about 26.4. 
And then there's quite a big difference. Their peak is 63 and our peak is 34. And if you look at the average to peak in California versus South Africa, you'll see that we have a much bigger primary baseload industry in South Africa than California. Their, their peak to average is much peakier, if I could put it that way, than what we are. So what Rethink X did is they said, what would it take to replace that whole load with batteries, wind and solar? And they plotted it and said, if we put in three times the peak, in other words, if the peak was 63, they would put in 180 gigawatts of wind and solar and a huge chunk of battery storage. That's what the total system cost would be. However, if they put in more wind and solar, they could reduce the number of batteries. Remember, this is to produce guaranteed electricity 24 seven. And they found that as you increased wind and solar, you could decrease your batteries, which makes intuitive sense. And you would get to a minimum point where your system cost to be able to deliver would be at a low point, the lowest point. Um, and that would be on this particular graph, if they put in four times the uh, peak generating capacity, they would be able to supply system at this cost. Now, if I look at California specifically, the lowest cost was at about just lower than four times general capacity. Uh, and they were coming in at just about $120 million. The interesting thing is if you increased your investment by as little as 10%, you could increase your generation capacity from 3.8 to 5, which is clearly much bigger than 10%. So the exciting thing, I think, anyways, I did this for South Africa. And I said, if we had a 2030 clean energy U curve, what would it look like? And the one thing I've changed here, instead of having the multiple of our peak demand, I've said, these multiples are multiples of the amount of generation that we use. So when it's one, it's 231 terawatt hours. When it's two, it would be double that, 262 terawatt hours. And you can see we have a low point here at about 1.5 or so, where we would be able to, we would have to spend about $100 billion uh, and we would have a complete uh, uh, wind, solar and storage system by 2030, hypothetically. So that's what it would look like. That's what the system would look like. We would put in 90 gigawatts of PV, 50 gigawatts of wind, 35 gigawatts, 385 gigawatt hours of storage. Now, I'm not advocating this. This is just a theoretical exercise. We would produce our 231 terawatt hours, which is our current uh, demand quite comfortably, and we would produce an additional 120 terawatt hours of what uh, the guys at Rethink X have called superpower. And that superpower is spare, but it wouldn't really be spare because by 2030, we're not only going to be using power for our current electric system, we're going to need the superpower to power things like the transport sector and industrial heating and cooling. So that's what it would look like. And this is just filling it in. So we would spend that much on solar, that much on wind and that much on battery. And we would be able to produce excess superpower, which is plotted on that red line. So you can see at the 1.5 times our current uh, demand, we would be producing about 120 surplus terawatt hours that would be able to go into the um, uh, transport sector and other sectors. So what does this look like? I'm actually not saying that we're going to sweep everything away and be totally renewable by 2030. I'm advocating that we can do it by 2040. And the recommended new build, very exciting for flexible storage, is what I showed in that earlier slide, two gigawatts of wind, three gigawatts of solar and one gigawatt of storage, four gigawatt hours. Now I'm advocating that we have an annual build that increases with time. And this means that we take advantage of the fact that the prices are dropping so uh, dramatically. We don't try and say we need so much in 10 years, divide by 10 and build a 10th each year. We start on a low amount 
and we increase annually, which also allows us to increase our uh, capacity for uh, construction. It allows us to increase capacity in any local manufacture that we might have done. This is what it looks like cumulatively. So I'm saying by 2040, we will have installed about uh, 200 odd uh, gigawatts of wind and solar and about um, uh, 60 gigawatts of, of battery energy storage. Now here's the interesting thing. The annual spend actually goes down in billions of dollars. So each year, if we increase wind, solar and batteries by about 10 percent in terms of installation, because their costs are reducing faster than this, apart from wind, wind reduces by about 6 percent a year, but batteries going down by about 15 percent a year and solar by about 12 percent a year. So you can see the battery and solar decreases in cost, although it's the, the solar is the biggest new build. And we have a consistent spend of about five, call it six billion dollars a year. Uh, this is our cumulative spend. So by 2040, we will have had to spend about $100 billion to have this system in place. Uh, this is a, what I call a modified IRP, showing two gigawatts of wind, three gigawatts of solar, four gigawatt hours of storage, and increasing these um, uh, by more or less 10 to 12 percent each year going through to 2040. And in conclusion, then, this is what it looks like. So this is where we currently are. And I want you specifically to look at focus on the demand curve, which is the red line. And you'll see that very quickly, uh, this thing is swamped by generation and our demand curve actually morphs to fit the generation curve that we are going to have. And whether it's 2030 or 2035 or 2040 is a matter of leadership and plan design on how we're going to adopt to this new future. So let's just watch it play out quickly. You can see the coal fleet decreasing, the wind and solar increasing, and by, by 2030 our demand profile has changed completely and it's now adapting to our generation profile. And that's it. That's me. We're going to we're moving into a phase where we are going to have a completely different generation profile and the demand is going to adapt to that. And it's happening really, really quickly at the moment because of the exponential reduction in costs in those three key, te key technologies. Thanks, Chris. Yes, Clyde is clearly very excited by the rapidly evolving electricity supply industry. Uh, together with the massive uh, deployment of renewable energy, uh, backed up by energy storage technologies such as battery energy storage and other energy storage technologies that exist today. Uh, he's also excited by the promise that these developments hold for community driven development, as well as diverse and innovative ownership models. So a really big thanks to Clyde for that uh, challenging and interesting presentation uh, and the thought that he has put into it and the work that he's put into it. Thank you, Clyde. Um, so it's uh, now uh, my uh, great uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, Crescent Mushwana. Uh, Crescent Mushwana holds a MEng degree in electrical engineering from the University of the Witwatersrand. Uh, he is currently employed by the CSIR as a research group leader in energy systems in the Energy Center at the CSIR, where he leads a group of researchers focusing on energy planning and power system planning operations for a future decarbonized energy system. Before joining the CSIR, he was working for Eskom in, transmis in transmission grid planning. Uh, so uh, uh, Crescent has had experience in both operations as well as uh, planning as well as now doing a deep level research uh, into uh, how to decarbonize our energy system and no doubt uh, energy storage together with renewable energy, gas to power, hydrogen are going to uh, become important areas uh, for consideration and we hope to hear more about that uh, today. Over to you Crescent. 
Uh, thank you very much, Chris, and um, and 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 and, th and th thanks to everyone for the opportunity to present um, what we are doing at the CSIR. And um, and basically, what our views are in terms of um, a future power system with uh, variable renewable energy. Uh, basically, if we look at variable renewable energy, that's that basically drives our research agenda in the. In, in the in the CSIR in the, in the in the research group that I'm representing. So basically, what I'm going to cover uh, in terms of the agenda, I'll cover some aspects in terms of power system reliability, what it's about. I'll look at solar PV and wind resources in South Africa. Look at the energy mix in the context of the IRP. Look at what's happening in terms of transmission developments, and then I will also be looking at some solar PV and wind statistics of installed power plants in South Africa. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so in terms of power system reliability, um, basically my presentation will focus more on the angle from a power system planner, uh, where power system reliability is a key thing in terms of integrating variable renewable energy. And um, and, and, and my, my colleagues, I know they've touched on uh, the technologies itself, how it assists in terms of different things and also uh, energy uh, planning aspects in terms of how the future energy system might look like, but I'll focus more on um, yeah, this issue of power system reliability. If you look at power system reliability, focuses on system security and system adequacy. And sometimes uh, when people speak of uh, reliability issues in terms of um, variable renewable energy, it will always be a mix of these issues. And um, at the bottom, I've just indicated that we've got grid codes and regulations and standards, which basically assist us in terms of dealing with these issues. And we've got the, um, uh, the medium term system adequate outlook um, uh, document by ESCOM and other operational guidelines that also help us. And then we also have got grid expansion plans and reliability projects that actually address uh, this um, uh, post system reliability issue as the grid expands. On the right hand corner, I've just in, uh, put um, a, a figure which basically speaks to system reliability and cost. At the end of the day, everything will be about cost, but making sure that you meet the technical requirements. So that balancing act is always very, very important in terms of looking at uh, future technologies that we have to implement uh, in terms of storage when we look at VRE. Next slide. Yeah, um, uh, this slide basically just shows, I won't dwell much on it, uh, the excellent wind and solar resources that we have in South Africa specifically. And of course, I mean, from the work that we have done in the CSIR and what others have done um, elsewhere, it's always confirmed that uh, our solar resource and wind resource is unparalleled anywhere in the world. And next slide. So this slide basically just shows some of the estimations in terms of the potential that we have in the country. And always when you speak of uh, renew variable renewable energy, there is always a concern in terms of uh, the land space that these variable energy sources uh, take. Uh, but from the study that we have done at the CSIR, um, looking at um, available land space, looking at all exclusion criteria that needs to be applied, and this started done, uh, this was the first phase of the renewable energy development zones that were done with the Department of Environmental Affairs. Um, the work that has been done to date has shown that the capacity is quite huge, more than what we we'll actually even need as a power system, even if you have to look at uh, long into the future, um, maybe even up to year 2050. Because uh, from some other studies that we have done, uh, the work within the CSR has indicated that if you have to look at the power system up to year 2050, based on some assumptions that have come from the DMRE in terms of future energy system, uh, the wind and solar resource that you need, uh, what we currently have even in terms of applications actually exceeds uh, what we'll even need by 2050 if you have to look at uh, future energy system. So in terms of South Africa, land is not a problem and the capacity in terms of wind and solar resource is quite huge, more than what we actually would, would need in this lifetime. Next slide. 
Yeah, in terms of what's happening with the current IRP, although the current IRP only goes up to year 2030, it's, it's very interesting to see the um, um, high uh, capacity um, uh, expansion allocations for both wind and PV, which have to be uh, introduced by 2030. I mean, this is like a very good development, although there are limitations even in terms of what wind and solar's annual build limits should be. Uh, but this is like a good start to show that the future energy system basically will be looking at wind and solar going into the future. And with this, definitely the need for flexibility in terms of the power system will be very critical and also the need for storage in terms of making sure that the power system has got all the resources that it needs to manage uh, this variable renewable energy would be very, very critical. So the capacities that are currently uh, planned up to 20, up to 2030, if you look at solar PV and wind, I mean, close to 20 gigawatts that has to be installed, which is very, very huge, uh, more than what was uh, envisioned in the past. And um, at least we've got some storage, we've got some gas that basically assist in terms of the flexibility requirements that will be required in the power system. But this basically just indicates that uh, the plans that the, even the department currently has, has put together for, for renewable energy are quite ambitious. And even beyond 2030, where studies still need to be done, the indication is that uh, this trajectory of having solar PV and wind dominate as the primary energy sources will still continue. Next slide. Yeah, so, so as I've highlighted, I've just uh, taken some extracts uh, from, um, from, 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 from the uh, IRP in terms of uh, what the thinking is in terms of solar PV and wind. Uh, because if you look at the energy system of the future, solar PV and wind, these will be the ones which will drive everything else that we do, either in terms of storage or flexibility that we need to introduce in the power system. So, so the IRP basically uh, concurs that uh, into the in the long run for a diversified energy mix um, with the annual build limits lifted for wind and solar, uh, basically wind and solar will definitely dominate what the future energy system will look like. And uh, also, although energy storage has not been like uh, properly modeled in the current IRP, but there is a realization that energy storage will play a major role uh, going forward. And, um, and also the realization that gas is a non-regret option. And if you look at energy storage and gas, I mean, that's a combined mix of flexibility and, um, and also uh, storage requirements that you need in, in terms of higher shares of variable renewable energy. Although the IRP is limited in terms of scope, but in terms of the thinking, I think the thinking is in the right direction in my view. Next slide. Yeah, so from previous work that we've done in the CSIR, um, looking at what the future energy system will look like, uh, we have done like uh, various uh, analysis utilizing actual data. And this was done as part of um, the IRP in 2016, which was like more de uh, detailed, although it was a draft version. And, um, and the study was done at that time to indicate what the future energy system would require. And if you look at uh, what, what we have in this slide, uh, basically we have like different um, cases that will be required. And I will dare to say that if you look at one, two, three, and four, all of these will speak to different technologies that will need to be employed in the power system to be able to manage variable renewable energy. I mean, demand shaping uh, technologies will definitely be, be required. If you look at demand response, that's required in terms of the future energy system. That will be a very key input in terms of how the energy system is managed. And then if you look at uh, number two, where you have to uh, apply technologies to move power to areas, to times when we have got consumption, that will be very key. Um, smart capabilities that will be required in the energy system going forward. And then looking at, um, and number number three, where we can be able to to apply different um, 
energy sources to supply the power system in terms of flexibility. Now speaking of natural gas, biogas, hydro, CSP, um, and going to the future could, could be any other technologies uh, that could be employed to supply power into the grid to provide that flexibility. That's what the energy future energy system will, will, will actually call for. And then number four, when we've got excess energy, uh, where you can be able to move some of the energy into some other sectors. And this speaks to, to heat, uh, transport, chemicals. And this is where also hydrogen comes in. And if you look into the future, there could be purpose-built uh, plants for hydrogen production. But if you look at the energy system, it could be built also around that to provide those opportunities uh, for, for, for the country. So our view is this is basically what the future is this going to look like and things are starting to shape up in that direction. Although in the country at the moment, we don't have a lot of um, excess, um, excess uh, uh, renewable energy production, which will actually push the other sectors, but the future, that's where it's going. Next slide. Yeah, so when we have like all these type of challenges, uh, if you look at, um, power system planners, of course, always the focus is on making sure that when we supply power, we've got all the ancillary services required to make sure that the power system is stable. And one of the key things, which of course, uh, most of the developed countries are focusing on is mostly like uh, frequency stability. But if you look at uh, areas where we've got weak systems, uh, issues of voltage stability because of high variable renewable energy, start to become issues and then rotor angle stability in terms of transient stability become to be like uh, serious issues as well. And all these aspects, uh, basically, if you look at the future power system that we're talking about where we've got flexibility and battery storage, being able to supply, uh, to work together with the variable renewable energy, you are able to supply all these ancillary services which are required uh, to make sure that you've got all the uh, uh, all, all the resources required to make sure that we maintain the frequency stability of the system and we also maintain the voltage and also transient stability um, of the system. Because for a system operator's point of view, this is like uh, critical to make sure that all this is maintained. And these technologies that my colleagues have spoken about in terms of um, uh, the battery storage, which has been like the main focus. And of course, if you look at uh, gas, hydro as well, and also other technologies like flywheels and um, all those type of technologies. Those are technologies which will need to be introduced to make sure that we maintain uh, power system stability, which is like just one aspect of reliability, which basically focuses on the security aspect of power system reliability. Uh, next slide. Uh, actually, it's very important to highlight uh, that um, if you look at the energy system currently and even going into the future, there is, um, there is an understanding that there are current solutions that definitely can be deployed to, um, to address most of the challenges that we currently have. This is just a list of some of the, um, of the uh, challenges uh, that we currently have in terms of stability issues and also technical solutions that actually exist to actually assist with that. And, um, and all these technical solutions, basically they speak to fast response in terms of uh, being able to um, ensure system stability in terms of frequency stability, transient stability, voltage control. And also, also if you have to look at uh, reduced contribution uh, to, to, to short-term currents in terms of um, where you need to uh, provide a system uh, system stability in a very, very short time. So all these technologies, they speak to fast response where the technologies like flexible te generation technology, battery energy storage technologies, basically speaking to the similar type of response. Because in the future, it won't be just about uh, technology, but basically the functionality, what the technology can provide to the power system the flexibility and the fast response to be able to make this sure the system is stable. And the tools are, uh, there are many tools which are currently existing to make sure that that is possible. So in, from a power systems point of view, it's making sure that all the requisite studies are done to make sure that the technical solutions that are required 
are employed appropriately. Next slide. Yeah, yeah this slide basically just to um, emphasize that storage and flexibility are quite critical. With high shares of uh, renewable energy, of course, the rampant requirements that are placed now on conventional energy plants um, will require to be to, 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 to be looked at. And then and also to look uh, in terms of storage, uh, storage basically can assist in terms of increasing the technical reliability of the power supply and to stabilize um, uh, the, co the cost of electricity. And, and of course, the key thing in terms of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we've got storage uh, um, uh, introduced. And, and also storage at the power plant level, if you look at the variable renewable energy plant, it can actually help even in terms of making those variable renewable energy plants have a certain level, level, level of dispatchability. Although, of course, um, they're not dispatchable by themselves, but having this uh, storage technologies being part of those renewable energy plants provides those opportunities for them to contribute more in terms of the system requirements. Next slide. Now, this slide basically just shows that even as we speak, there are many projects that uh, transmission, uh, grid planning, and other uh, and other planning. Um, yeah, play, 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 plan, planning uh, departments uh, within ESCOM and government are doing to strengthen the grid, to expand the grid as well. So this slide basically just shows that all new technologies that we are talking about, which have to speak with the grid, um, grid strengthening or grid reliability improvements will basically be included as part of what system planners do in terms of uh, making sure that the grid will be able to meet the future requirements. And um, this, this, this slide basically just shows some of the planned and also the transmission planning projects which are done over the past 10 years. And, and with the future energy system that we're looking at, um, the idea here will be to make sure that uh, all these expansion projects will actually be looking at future technologies uh, that we envisage as being critical to make sure that we're able to manage a system with high variable renewable energy shares. Next slide. Yeah, on this slide, basically, I'm just speaking to some of the statistics uh, that we've had uh, recently in terms of um, uh, renewable energy yeah, in South Africa. As you can see, currently we've got close to four uh, gigawatts of uh, renewable energy installed, um, wind, solar PV and, and CSP. And, um, and this has been like uh, growing from, from 2013 and this has been like a very steady growth. And uh, going into the future, although the growth seems to be a little bit stagnant somewhat from 2017 up to 2019, but going into the future with the future bid rounds expected, I mean, this is the type of trajectory that we see continuing in South Africa going to the future and predominantly wind and solar PV. Although CSP, there's a great um, uh, place for it in terms of playing into the power system, but wind and solar PV will still continue to dominate. Next slide. Yeah, this slide basically just speaks to the seasonality in terms of a capacity factor that we see from the, uh, from, from, from the energy sources. I mean, as you can see, the capacity factors, especially for wind, I think they've always um, in South Africa ex exceeded expectation in terms of uh, what the theory says in terms of the capacity factors that we can have. And uh, even for, for, for solar, I think South Africa is just doing quite well. And we're able to maintain uh, throughout the seasons um, very high capacity factors for, for, for these technologies. And that's why going to the future, if you look at wind and solar, if they come at scale, they will continue to basically um, exceed expectation in terms of what they're able to contribute throughout the year in terms of uh, the energy system. I mean, for capacity factors of um, anything more than 30 is considered excellent anywhere in the world. And in South Africa, we can see that we're always exceeding uh, that level um, uh, throughout the different seasons. Next slide. Yeah, this slide basically uh, just speaks to 
what we see in terms of the renewable energy contribution, um, uh, their profiles on a monthly basis, and and these are the profiles that basically will constitute what the future energy system looks like. I mean, this is still at small scale in terms of uh, penetration to the grid because I mean it's just like uh, below uh, 2.5 gigawatts uh, combined. But if you look at um, the profile that we're actually seeing now, this is what we have to plan the future energy system around. And we're starting to see it now in terms of the statistics that come from the renewable energy plants which have been um, uh, connected. And this basically sets us on a path to start planning for this future energy system. And this is the type of profiles that we'll see as the future bulk service providers for our energy system. Next slide. Yeah, this slide uh, basically just shows that uh, both wind and solar PV and also CSP have been uh, contributing uh, to our peak demand at different times. And it is very important to highlight that, um, I mean, although sometimes it's not like very clear to, to the public, but of course, at the system operations level, when we, when we hit the peak or when we hit uh, incidences where we've got um, excess uh, demand, wind and solar PV, in most cases, they're also there to supply the energy that is needed. And of course, in some cases, the capacity that's needed around those peaks. And we are able to, because of wind and solar PV, be able to reduce even some impact in terms of the load shading that is being experienced because uh, those technologies are able to provide um, energy during those uh, critical times. And going to the future, this will just become more. And once you introduce storage, um, these benefits will just increase even much, much more. And the energy system can be planned around that as well to make sure that when the system is constrained, storage and our flexibility and uh, wind and solar PV work together to make sure that we are able to supply energy when it is needed. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so basically this would be, I just decided to put this as my concluding slide uh, basically just to emphasize uh, that this is the future energy system that is uh, staring us in the face. And uh, in my view, everything that is being done currently in terms of technology deployment, in terms of storage, uh, technology de de deployment in terms of um, flexible generation could be gas or it could be also pumped hydro as well. And also looking at the future um, sector coupling opportunities that the country has in terms of looking at um, uh, synthetic fuels, even hydrogen production going to the future. Um, uh, this slide basically just captures everything that all these technologies and this future that we're looking at in terms of um, uh, power to X in terms of sector coupling. This is where we are going and uh, the technologies and uh, everything that's been done that is being done should be done to make sure that we are not only able to operate the power system, but the power system or electricity sector will be actually be the driver of what the what the other future energy um, uh, carriers yeah, will be. And in this case, uh, more specifically, hydrogen as the hot topic at the moment. So this will be my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mushwana, for your presentation. Um, indeed, you've, there were some gems of uh, knowledge there that we would like uh, to tease out in the future, uh, in the future, uh, as in the next few minutes in question time. Um, but thank you again for sharing your time and uh, uh, with us and being with us uh, this uh, today. So we are now going to uh, fly over to um, Italy, Rome, and uh, joining us from Rome is uh, Alessandro Cesa, who is currently the head of uh, storage uh, business development in Asia, Pacific, Africa, and the Middle East regions of NL Green Power. Before this, he was uh, in charge of thermal generation business development in South Africa and uh, was part of the power marketing analysis team, defining group strategy in emerging markets and new businesses. Prior to his business uh, development role, 
He acted as an independent management advisor on nuclear safety and for the implementing best practices across the NL nuclear portfolio. Alessandro holds a master's degree in energy and nuclear engineering. Over to you, Alessandro, and uh, looking to your presentation. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Tabank, and uh, good uh, morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for this opportunity to uh, participate uh, today. Uh, my present during my presentation, uh, I will start uh, with a uh, uh, very quick introduction about uh, Enel Group and uh, our uh, activities uh, in, uh, in South Africa and uh, uh, move uh, to uh, the, the role that we see uh, for uh, energy storage in combination with renewables uh, for the transition uh, to renewable uh, energies. I will uh, share, I mean, uh, what is our, uh, our view of the future of uh, uh, energy mix uh, in uh, in uh, in, in an international context and uh, uh, focus then on the services and the benefits that can be provided by storage uh, to support uh, uh, this transition and to support the stability of the of the network for uh, uh, yeah thanks so basically uh, and a group uh, is uh, uh, one of the largest uh, uh, international uh, companies uh, in uh, in the energy sector, uh, we are uh, present uh, in uh, 32 uh, countries over five uh, uh, continents, and we are uh, our business is focused on uh, electricity generation, uh, distribution, and uh, retail. Our main drivers, as of today, is uh, I mean focusing uh, our uh, trans transitioning from thermal to renewable energies. We are currently operating a fleet uh, of uh, 46 uh, gigawatt of uh, renewable projects worldwide and we are actually growing this capacity by more than uh, three gigawatt on a yearly basis and uh, we are also seeing i mean the into that we, we are also focusing on the transition from uh, of the energy sector from uh, uh, to uh, the provision from electricity so we, we see that electricity is uh, is uh, having uh, more and more growing roles in uh, in the uh, global energy mix and uh, we're focusing also on the services that uh, can facilitate this transition in order to uh, make uh, to to make it uh, more sustainable for the for the in uh, in our countries of presence uh, next uh, slide please uh, as of today i mean uh, south africa is uh, our uh, main country of presence uh, in, uh, uh, in the african continent we are uh, operating uh, uh, more than 500 uh, megawatt uh, renewable uh, projects uh, in uh, divided divided in five wind uh, and uh, two uh, sorry five five solar and uh, two wind uh, projects and we have uh, we have actually under construction uh, additional 700 megawatt of uh, of uh, wind uh, and we are obviously planning to uh, further uh, i mean uh, uh, increase our role in uh, in the country and uh, to deploy uh, a, even additional innovative technologies uh, uh, include to provide flexibility in the in the mix uh, and uh, facilitate uh, the increased uh, role of uh, renewable generation in the country uh, next uh, slide please uh, in the in this slide you will see i mean an, an overview of uh, uh, our uh, our uh, uh, energy storage uh, uh, projects uh, uh, combined to uh, generation in, uh, that we delivered uh, so far uh, uh, internationally. You will see that uh, we have uh, already a portfolio of uh, uh, more than uh, 500 uh, uh, megawatt projects uh, uh, in execution or uh, already in operation. The largest part of this uh, is uh, as of today in, uh, in the United States and uh, secondly in Europe because uh, uh, I, I, will, I will explain this more in detail in the next slides but basically because uh, I mean as of now I mean the, the economics of energy storage uh, work better I mean in, uh, in countries where uh, uh, there is the opportunity to access uh, uh, in, uh, in the 
in the, with the participation uh, in uh, ancillary services markets, which uh, I mean are uh, uh, one of the uh, has been so far one of the key uh, drivers of develop deployment of this uh, technology alongside the renewable generation. But uh, we we have also actually a very uh, broad pipeline of additional project that is uh, uh, exceeding uh, seven uh, seven gigawatt that uh, are uh, I mean is uh, is uh, spread. I mean. Uh, also uh, across additional uh, countries, including South Africa, where uh, we are also exploring uh, uh, new applications, considering uh, thanks to the uh, progressive degrees of the cost of storage uh, and uh, the opportunity of uh, and uh, the opportunity to to provide additional services that go beyond uh, the simple uh, business model of uh, ancillary service provision. Uh, if we move to the next uh, uh, slide. You will see, uh, I mean, in, in this slide, we, we are focusing on the uh, strategy rational for uh, uh, installing uh, energy storage covered with renewables, uh, which is, uh, I mean, these are the main drivers that uh, we see for uh, for this uh, for uh, storage technology. First of all, we see that uh, the by combining uh, storage to uh, renewable uh, technologies, we are uh, capable to overcome the the main limitation of renewable technologies as of today, that is the fact that, uh, I mean, the generation is linked uh, to uh, the availability of renewable resource. By adding storage, we are uh, capable to provide uh, uh, flexibility to this generation to make uh, and, and uh, provide uh, uh, the opportunity to make it uh, uh, dispatchable or uh, more flexible to uh, adapt to the needs uh, of the markets where the where renewable generation is uh, is deployed. The second uh, rationale for uh, uh, adding storage to uh, renewables is uh, that uh, it uh, has also uh, a, a, a risk mitigation role for uh, for our projects because uh, what we see is that uh, uh, with increased uh, penetration of renew renewables in the energy mix, uh, there are some uh, uh, additional issues that uh, uh, may arise, like the one of uh, congestion on, in the network of uh, having, for example, uh, all solar generation at the same time or uh, all wind generation. I mean, when the when the wind is blowing, is blowing, and uh, this can lead to congestion and uh, curtailment to projects. Or uh, likewise, in some markets, uh, there are some. Uh, Penalty mechanism introduced being introduced uh, for uh, to for what concern I mean the, the deviation between uh, uh, scaled uh, production and real production of uh, of generators. Obviously, I mean the scheduling of uh, renewable generation is uh, is not perfect because it uh, it depends on uh, on the weather and uh, on uh, many other factors. So having uh, the opportunity to correct uh, any deviation from the schedule in order to uh, improve, I mean, the, the stability of the mix uh, is uh, uh, a great benefit for uh, renewable technologies and storage is capable to provide this uh, this type of service. Lastly, uh, the storage is uh, allowing uh, renewable generation to uh, provide uh, additional services to the grid or to takers because uh, as of now, I mean, uh, renewable energy is uh, has been deployed uh, uh, mostly for uh, uh, simple energy generation. On uh, uh, that, uh, it was that, uh, but the addition of storage is, enab is enabling uh, renewable projects to uh, have the enough su sufficient flexibility to provide uh, also ancillary services or to provide uh, peaking energy or to uh, this to be dispatched according to specific profiles and uh, these uh, obviously as a as a value also for uh, both for customers and uh, for uh, investors so it's uh, it opens up uh, new opportunities and uh, lastly the the one of the main reasons for uh, co-locating storage uh, with with uh, uh, with generators is the fact uh, that uh, it uh, it provides also the opportunity to capture some synergies because we, by by the by mean of the collocation, we are capable to uh, first of all to provide uh, more sales services with the same project, uh, so we have an opportunity to uh, create more value with the project. 
But secondly, we are also having a better use of infrastructure because uh, by sharing the grid connection, by sharing the permitting activities, uh, by having one single uh, injection I mean, in the network, we are also uh, having a, a significant upside uh, of, uh, of, the, of the overall economics compared to standalone uh, applications because we obviously we have uh, uh, some synergies uh, and uh, in, in costs we can share the cost uh, because I mean there are uh, and this is mostly due to the improved uh, utilization factor uh, of the of the connection because we we shift from a uh, uh, connection infrastructure that is, is used only when the renewable project is generate is generating to a better uh, utilization because we are capable to extend the the hours in which we are providing energy and services so we with the same infrastructure we can uh, we can provide the uh, additional uh, value uh, moving to next slide please uh, in this slide i mean you you will see uh, some uh, specific examples of of, uh, of the application that i mentioned uh, earlier uh, with focus uh, on uh, uh, and examples of the markets where uh, it is uh, uh, more uh, uh, valuable. First of all, I mean the in the the main the, the main activities that you will see on the on the top of these slides are the fact that uh, uh, storage can uh, improve the profitability of a renewable uh, project in uh, in in uh, European in, in European markets, uh, United States uh, or uh, Australia, for example, that are mar markets where uh, uh, there, are, there is uh, the opportunity to participate openly to ancillary services and uh, uh, or there are some uh, capacity uh, payment uh, mechanism. Basically in, uh, in these markets it is uh, possible I mean to uh, provide uh, additional services uh, with renewable uh, generators thanks to the installation of storage and uh, we are uh, capable to displace uh, uh, the or better to, to provide these services uh, at uh, most competitive cost than uh, what is done uh, by the existing technologies in the uh, in those energy mix that are uh, actually thermal power plants. So historically, I mean, the ancillary services are, are provided by uh, coal and uh, gas generators, but actually uh, by combining storage to renewables, we are capable to provide the same services at a more competitive cost and uh, creating value both for the investors and uh, for the final customers because uh, we are uh, actually reducing the cost of these uh, uh, technologies. The second uh, application and the, the second value driver that you see, uh, as I mentioned before, is the risk mitigation. So basically uh, this, uh, this means that I mean where, uh, for example, uh, there are uh, uh, some penalty mechanism for, for renewables. Uh, such as, for example, the uh, the losses for during uh, network uh, uh, congestions, we are actually capable to reduce this uh, uh, this risk for uh, for renewable projects, and uh, therefore, I mean, it is uh, uh, that there is a uh, uh, tangible benefits uh, uh, for uh, for the deployment of renewables uh, uh, with storage. The last point that is a. Uh, probably the, the most relevant for South Africa is the fact uh, that uh, uh, storage uh, is, uh, I mean, uh, uh, also uh, an enabler of uh, additional service for uh, uh, for renewable generation. So, uh, for example, uh, in, ca in countries where there is no market mechanism for the ancillary services and uh, uh, so participation is uh, uh, related to uh, public tenders uh, that uh, are uh, designed to procure these tenders, uh, there is still the opportunity to provide, uh, I mean, the, all the, all, all the uh, portfolio of uh, services that uh, can be of ancillary services or profile or uh, peak generation that can be provided uh, in other markets. Uh, with, uh, and uh, the, there is an opportunity, I mean, to provide these services uh, at uh, a more, still at uh, a more uh, competitive price for the final customer, uh, compared to uh, what is uh, achievable uh, uh, with uh, uh, thermal generators. We we can move to the next, to the next uh, uh, slide, please. Yeah. 
Okay, here we, you in this slide you will see uh, uh, an overview of uh, uh, the 2040 uh, projection of the energy mix uh, of uh, uh, several countries. So we have, we will see either in Spain uh, for uh, Europe we see Australia, Brazil, and uh, uh, the central part of the uh, United States. You will see that. Uh, uh, in uh, the, the forecast uh, for 2040 is that uh, basically renewables, in particular solar and wind, will uh, actually uh, cover uh, almost uh, uh, the totality of the uh, renewable generation. And uh, this is due to the fact that uh, already as of today, renewable energy is uh, uh, the cheapest uh, technology to provide. Sorry, back to the previous slide. Is the cheapest uh, technology to provide uh, uh, energy, and uh, in most of this, in most of the market, uh, uh, renewable plus storage are already uh, more convenient uh, than uh, uh, thermal generation, and in particular of, of gas, uh, to provide uh, peaking generation. Uh, this uh, uh, cost competitiveness against uh, uh, gas and uh, traditional generators will. Uh, with further increase, I mean, with the progressive uh, cost uh, reduction that we, we will see in uh, in this technology. So uh, most likely, I mean, I mean, what we expect is that uh, in future, I mean, the 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 energy mix will be uh, dominated by uh, renewable generation, and uh, it will be, and uh, this uh, renewable generation will need to be complemented uh, by flexible uh, generation. And we see that uh, uh, the, the key technologies to provide this type of flexibility will be uh, storage and uh, dynamic uh, demand. By dynamic demand, I mean uh, demand response uh, services, or uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, in all these services like the uh, dynamic uh, charging of uh, electric vehicles that uh, will uh, can uh, can be used actively as a uh, uh, as, a, as a, an additional uh, source of storage for the energy mix. So we believe that storage and uh, uh, dynamic demand services will be able, first of all, to compensate the uh, intermittency of uh, renewable generation. They will be able to shift uh, most uh, uh, of the uh, renewable, pro renewable production that is uh, produced in excess uh, from solar in uh, central hours of the day and uh, will uh, uh, reduce the need of, uh, uh, I mean, or better, will we'll actually provide uh, peaking services, uh, uh, in particular when they're uh, during the, at, the, at the times of the day where there will be peak demand or uh, a sharp change in the generation of uh, renewable uh, energy. For example, uh, I mean, th this is uh, very visible in the slides. For example, if we look at uh, the Italian and uh, uh, Spain uh, charts, chart, you will see that uh, uh, as soon as the solar production uh, uh, goes down, there is a very uh, sharp change in uh, the in the generation mix and uh, storage uh, or flexible technology will be uh, definitely important in order to provide uh, to the system operator, the capability to respond to this uh, change of need of uh, uh, generation while uh, uh, keeping uh, the the system in uh, safe operation, and uh, will be capable to provide uh, uh, these uh, ancillary services to support uh, stability during this time at uh, in in a, in a more effective way. Uh, compared to what is uh, currently done uh, by thermal generations. Thermal generators, due to the uh, uh, due to the uh, faster uh, capability to deploy power, and uh, the fact uh, that uh, there are no uh, there is a, a much smaller inertia in in uh, in uh, uh, power variations uh, or in cost to provide this uh, uh, this uh, fast uh, and uh, this fast response to the energy needs of the system. If we move to the uh, next slide. Please, OK, yeah, in this uh, in this slide, I mean, we'll see we see that uh, what is I mean, 
an international view of uh, uh, of uh, uh, the cost expected cost decrease for uh, storage technology. I mean, this chart represents uh, the uh, total cost, so not only the battery cells, but uh, also the additional components that are required for uh, uh, energy storage uh, system. You see that as of today, I mean, and and uh, the, the, the focus is uh, in this slide is uh, uh, lithium uh, ion. So we see that lithium ion batteries uh, have already seen uh, very uh, sharp cost decrease compared to uh, over the past uh, five years, and uh, we 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 do expect uh, a very significant uh, decrease uh, close to uh, between 40 and 50 percent between now and uh, 2030. This uh, uh, very steep decline, I mean, will. Uh, uh, enable uh, the utilization of, uh, of storage for uh, additional applications uh, uh, such as the uh, the shifting of uh, of, uh, of renewable energy of, of, of large amount of energy uh, from uh, uh, hours of excessive production to the hours of uh, uh, actual demand and uh, in this chart i mean we, we see only a lithium battery but actually there are uh, uh, also additional technologies uh, such as uh, uh, flow batteries uh, that can be capable to provide the uh, uh, similar uh, cost degree strength, making the uh, storage technology uh, one of the, uh, the most uh, uh, competitive uh, tools to provide flexibility to energy mix. And uh, at last, I mean, uh, I, I, know, I mean, the we see, I mean, here the the cost curve for uh, batteries of uh, up to uh, four hour duration. But I mean, these uh, additional innovative technologies will be capable to provide uh, uh, very competitive costs uh, also for uh, uh, longer duration. And uh, and uh, ad additional technologies uh, uh, such as, uh, uh, for example, uh, hydrogen renewable green hydrogen production will be capable to to support the system. Uh, and uh, to complement uh, uh, its ability for uh, for longer duration. Uh, if we move to the uh, next uh, uh, slide, please. OK, yeah. Uh, basically here we see, I mean, uh, an overview of all the services that can be provided by uh, renewable uh, plus storage or uh, thermal plus storage because uh, we see, I mean, the opportunity to combine storage also to uh, existing thermal power plants. Basically, uh, the, on the top left part of the screen, you you see, I mean, the applications that have been uh, an, uh, an anchor for uh, the deployment of uh, uh, energy storage uh, so far, and uh, which are the ones uh, that uh, I mean, where that are, uh, have been so far most most effective uh, for uh, and where storage has added uh, more value. And these are in particular uh, related to the uh, provision of uh, ancillary services. So we have the uh, spinning reserve, uh, frequency regulation, and uh, uh, or substitution of uh, uh, primary reserve from, from existing projects uh, that uh, are uh, or uh, all system uh, all services related uh, to the to the uh, management of uh, uh, system frequency and. Uh, this type of services all together can be uh, stacked, uh, provided uh, in a in a stacked way by the by the same system, allowing to provide uh, stability to the network uh, uh, in case of uh, uh, frequency devi deviations uh, from uh, uh, both in case of uh, small deviations around the, the normal uh, uh, operating band as well as uh, acting uh, as, a, as a reserve uh, in case uh, of uh, uh, contingency events uh, in, uh, in the network. So uh, the traction storage can, uh, is, is very effective in providing this type of uh, grid stability services. Uh, the second point, the, the, the second main application is the one of uh, uh, peaking capacity that uh, can be uh, very important as well for uh, South Africa, where uh, basically uh, the, there could be uh, a benefit of uh, using uh, the combination of uh, storage and renewables uh, to be capable to 
shift uh, the renewable generation in the peak hours of the day in order to be uh, to reduce the utilization of uh, uh, more exp expensive uh, uh, technologies to deal with uh, uh, the the peak demand and uh, on the on the right part of the screen i mean you will see ad additional applications uh, such as the uh, profile farming and uh, energy shifting as of now i mean these uh, type of applications uh, have not yet been uh, the the main drivers for investing in storage because uh, to provide massive uh, uh, energy shifting, I mean, you or uh, to provide a a full base of profile, I mean, you will need uh, a a very long duration battery. And uh, uh, over the past years, I mean, the the cost uh, are not, have not been uh, yet. Uh, I, I mean, we're, we're not competitive against uh, uh, traditional technologies, but uh, we believe that I mean, this uh, uh, type of applications will become uh, very relevant uh, for. Uh, for the years to come, as soon as the uh, the cost of the technology will uh, uh, further uh, improve. And uh, lastly, I mean, we see that uh, uh, renewable plus storage are capable to provide also uh, voltage uh, uh, control by the provision of uh, reactive power. This is, uh, I mean, one of no, th this is a, a type of application that uh, is uh, can be provided alongside all the other services by a renewable plus storage system. The only point I mean why it is, uh, and it is actually being provided in uh, in, in most of, uh, of uh, our market of presence. The only reason why it is not uh, shown as an, an anchor application is, uh, is this because uh, this, is, this is an additional service that generally is uh, uh, provided uh, without uh, any linked remuneration to the system operator, operators. But, uh, uh, storage, I mean, can, can allow to, uh, provide uh, uh, so to, to manage in addition to the frequency also the voltage control or black start of uh, of power system to make sure that that uh, I mean the the mix the energy mix will be managed in the most safe way and the most, most competitive uh, way uh, that's all for me I give uh, give uh, the floor back to uh, Chris and uh, Tabang well, thank you very much, uh, Alessandro, for that presentation all the way from Rome in Italy. Uh, it's a great honor to have you here today. I was just taking another look at your uh, resume and, and how you started in the uh, nuclear sort of uh, activity, uh, moving on to the thermal generation activity, and now to the future, <laughs> the future being uh, uh, being renewable energy plus flexible uh, generation uh, in the form of battery storage, uh, gas to power, uh, and, uh, and and all these new and exciting technologies which are really changing the world of power generation on its head, away from the old world of base loadism uh, to the new world of flexible generation, uh, which is going to, people are going to pay a premium for flexible generation in the future. Uh, but interestingly enough, uh, with the prices coming down, uh, uh, maybe that uh, people will be able to get a discount for flexible generation. And that's what's driving this uh, new uh, technology, this new approach to, to power system uh, performance, uh, driving it forward. So thank you very much, Alessandro, uh, for, for your, uh, your time uh, and, um, and greetings to Italy. We'll be taking some questions. Um, obviously, we may not be able to take all of them, um, but we'll try our best to uh, squeeze as many as we can. So um, for the first uh, uh, round, uh, I'll introduce two questions to the panel. Um, and I would like to start uh, with uh, a question that was posed uh, at the very beginning of the uh, webinar by JB Sneiman that says, has super capacitor technology been proven? Um, I think this would have gone to our first pre um, presenter, which is Frederick. Uh, Frederick, would you want to do that? Um, and then after that, um, I'll also like the question also asked by Max Carcass, um, that the 300 megawatts pumped storage in a mine mentioned, for what duration is that? Yeah, maybe you could take both of that. Uh, if not, then the other colleagues may help you to answer. Um, Frederick? 
Thank you, Tabang. Um, so, first of all, on on on, on a general response on on technologies. Uh, um, basically, what uh, what we tr uh, trying to see uh, from the, the battery technology suppliers is that uh, the they put forward their product instead of put for putting forward a solution. What is needed is an energy storage solution, not the technology A or B or X. So meaning that uh, one very general comment, and then we saw that for many, many World Bank funded projects around the world, is for the, the, the different technology uh, experts to start with the need in country or the need in the power system, and then see if their technology fits, and then propose a commercial offer. The way the other way around never works, uh, and then it's, it's, it has shown that uh, it never works. So now on the specific supercapacitor uh, question, it is a proven uh, technology in the sense that it works. After that, is it commercially viable? I would say it depends on the need. <laughs> I mean, uh, obviously this is a technology that can store and, and release a very large amount of, uh, of, uh, in, of uh, power, uh, but during a short period of time. So there is a, a certainly a niche market for that. Uh, on the other way of the spectrum, there is a niche market also for batteries that, uh, that have a, a long duration, but uh, with, uh, with small, small uh, capacity. So what I, sorry not answering directly to the question, but, uh, but basically uh, the response is uh, it depends. Maybe the other colleagues can, can also provide input. Hmm. Well, thank you for that, um, uh, Frederick. Uh, there was that other question. Uh, the second question is that from Max Carcass, who was asking that a 300 megawatt pump storage in a mine application was mentioned. For what duration? Uh, well, I can only tell you what I've been told by Tizan Krupp, uh, that they can certainly do that for 10 hours, uh, 300 megawatts for 10 hours. So uh, I think I'll move on to uh, another question now. Uh, another two questions before handing back to Tabang. Um, so uh, the question uh, here uh, is, uh, could you give us a comparison of the different battery technologies in terms of efficiency of the technology? In other words, percent lost during the storing and recovering of electricity and the cost of the technology in dollars per kilowatt hour capacity. Essentially trying to get in, this uh, question is trying to get into his mind around the overall economics of the different technologies and how battery storage <coughs> compares with other technologies. Uh, perhaps, um, uh, Clyde, would you like to tackle that question? Um, and uh, I'll move on to the next question after that. Yeah, I'm going to tackle it very quickly because it's too detailed to get into huge details here. The, the top end of efficiency is about 90%, the bottom end is about 70%. So these batteries for different applications, uh, generally speaking, lithium iron are best for power and perhaps up to four hours duration storage. And then you'll find some of the other ones like flow batteries or pump storage in mines or uh, making bricks out of old mine dumps to lift weights and lower them start coming in. But generally speaking, the other technologies are uh, have slightly uh, lower round trip efficiencies. Maybe 80% is a good average mark. Uh, and the point is that the cost in, uh, I used cost for lithium iron as a, as a reference because as I mentioned, that's uh, clearly uh, well documented and the reduction in costs over the last 10 years is well documented. And so I imagine, not imagine, I know that uh, energy storage by 2030 for the whole shebang, not just the DC, the DC, the, the power control system, the inverters and everything will be under $100 a kilowatt hour. Uh, uh, no question about that. At which point, I also just want to mention that in terms of cost competitive, we should stop worrying about looking at batteries to fill in the gaps from variable renewables. We've, we're going to have so much in terms of renewable generation. The battery's role is going to be harvest, is to be to harvest ex, excess renewable and dispatch it at more convenient times. There's going to be very few occasions when 
uh, the, the, the renewable energy is so variable that you have to call upon the battery. As a quick example, the sun comes up pretty much. We know when it's going to come up each day and when, obviously, if these clouds, it interferes. But it's, it's more a case of batteries in the future will be delivering electricity mainly at night time and harvesting electricity mainly during the daytime. Whereas at present, it's kind of the reverse of that because our current systems tend to produce excess at night and we have a shortage at peak times in the daytime. That's going to be turned on its head. So the economics work, uh, they're getting cheaper all the time, and uh, one, one waits with bated breath for further improvements in different forms of the technology at any point in time to see uh, what's most competitive at a particular point in time. Thanks, Clyde. On to the second question uh, that I want to pose, and perhaps Alessandro, if you can tackle this. Um, uh, the, the questioner says, uh, batteries have storage capacity for only 60 minutes of dispatchable capacity. Not so sure about that, but anyway, perhaps you can comment. Has a cost benefit analysis been done relative to green hydrogen? And what is the return in US dollars per kilowatt hour investment versus kilowatt hour dispatched from batteries? Uh, African country outages last for a lot longer than 60 minutes, for example, Eskom load shedding. So I think he's asking the question, uh, you know, are batteries really suitable uh, for filling in the gaps, uh, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a power system? Yeah. Uh, Alessandro, can you tackle that? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, for the uh, first question regarding the 60 minutes uh, maximum duration, this is actually uh, not uh, uh, correct. I mean, battery cells can be sized uh, for uh, uh, any uh, for different type of duration. I mean, the most commercial uh, uh, size that we see being deployed uh, worldwide are uh, between 30 minutes uh, and uh, uh, four hours uh, duration. They still can, can be they still can be competitive uh, uh, even for a longer duration and uh, nothing prevents operating uh, uh, a battery system at uh, uh, lower power in order to harvest uh, the, its energy content uh, over a, a longer uh, time period. Meaning that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's uh, once you have the capability, if you have energy content enough, I mean, you can uh, uh, release that, uh, that energy at any time it is uh, uh, needed. And uh, for what concerns the second question regarding the uh, cost benefit and the comparison with uh, uh, green hydrogen, I mean, there's a lot of uh, studies ongoing on uh, green, green hydrogen. It is uh, still, I mean, uh, an, uh, an innovative uh, technology that uh, has uh, definitely a very big potential of uh, uh, becoming cost competitive in, uh, in future. As of today, it has uh, not reached yet uh, the, the parity with existing technologies, but uh, we, we expect green hydrogen to, to play a, a very important role in uh, in future. Thanks, Alessandro. And I'm now going to hand over to Tabang uh, for the next two questions. Tabang. Yes, thank you, Chris. And um, the next one is from Jan Lo Engelbrecht. He says, if power generation in South Africa is to include both batteries and natural gas generation, it means the producer cannot be carbon neutral unless obtaining carbon credits from somewhere else. How will this affect the cost of uh, energy increase in South Africa? He hasn't said to whom he wants to post this, um, but I think we all expect on this, uh, who wants to take a, 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 a hit at it. I'm, I'm happy to comment if, if, if no one else is. Just, just very do. briefly, uh, very briefly, uh, any need that we might have for gas going forward is going to be for small quantities of gas with potentially relatively large installed capacity. Uh, the modeling I've done has shown that the costs in the competing technologies, wind, solar and storage, are coming down so rapidly that any commitment to long-term gas offtake would be a decision of regret, not of no regret. And so if you just sort of think about our current electricity system with the open cycle gas turbines, uh, although we use diesel in those open circle gas, uh, cycle gas turbines, they only produce about between one and two percent of South Africa's energy requirement. So there's quite a lot of, and yet they constitute about 10 percent of our installed capacity. 
And so any any notion or move towards long term combined cycle or high capacity factor gas usage in South Africa is clinging to the past rather than looking to the future, in my opinion. So uh, I would just say the best way to reduce your carbon, if that's what you're worried about, is to not go anywhere near gas. Mm. There is one. Thank you. Thank you, Clyde. Oh, and Frederick, you want to add? OK, yeah, go ahead. Just to, com to complement quickly what Clyde said also, uh, if one is interested in, in uh, adding the carbon price and carbon tax into the equation, I would much more worry about uh, the core uh, fleet that is existing that on the future gas fleet, meaning that uh, obviously this will accelerate decarbonization because it would not be sustainable to have uh, to pay uh, a, a, coal, uh, a carbon price on the on the kilowatt hour that is very carbonized in South Africa. That's just on the climate aspect. Uh, uh, gas would not be the big elephant in the room. Over. OK, no, thank you so much uh, for, for that addition. Um, there's another one here, and also it's not addressed to anyone in particular, um, but uh, it's got a popular uh, swing to it from from the audience they say when the wind does not blow let's say for several days and the sun does not shine for extended periods again several days the capacity of stored energy systems such as batteries will unlikely meet the shortfall for the prolonged periods then what that's uh, Raj Drog Chan who is asking to to be as provocative as a question, I would say is that the um, reason why um, we put we put <laughs> wind and, and solar where the wind blows and the sun shines. Yeah, I, I'm 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 happy to take that one as well. First of all, the modeling I've done uses a, a real data sets, eight seven six zero data sets, and these very the, the, these almost zero occasions where the wind doesn't blow for three days in a row, as indicated. The other thing that's very important in the modeling I've got. By 2040, we'll have something like 150 megawatts of solar, uh, gigawatts of solar. And even if it's overcast over the whole country, that will produce at 30% of its capacity. So you're still going to get 50 gigawatts of output, even on an overcast day. Um, and so, yeah, the best I can do is to look at real data sets and model with them. And I can tell you unequivocally that the periods where we run into a bit of trouble are days where there's lower sunshine for maybe two or three days in a row, and the levels of storage that are built into the system can easily handle that. There's no problem. There's no occasion when, in fact, I, 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 I modeled it in a very conservative fashion to, to make sure that there wasn't one hour of load shedding in the year which is why I've got more uh, capacity in my energy storage uh, modeling then is perhaps necessary if you were prepared to say ex accept uh, one or two days with a certain amount of load shedding but I modeled it where there was zero load shedding and of course I didn't I didn't bring into account a demand response either and so when you when you harvesting from a generation profile rather than trying to fill a demand profile you're in a very lucky position in that you can harvest when the harvest is good and you can cut back when the generation profile pulls back and people will do that de facto. You don't have to charge your electric vehicle every every day in order to have it uh, operational. So uh, it's it's actually not a problem. The, the notion of when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine is a non-issue in the future. Uh, okay, because of the scale like, at which uh, we're going to build. Yeah. Yeah, OK, thank you so much, Clyde. Um, just before I hand over to Chris, just to say that all the presentations that have been made shall, uh, will be um, circulated to uh, people on this webinar. Um, and uh, just as I hand over to you, there is actually a question to you, Chris. Um, I don't know if you want to take one, but I think you should as you take it over. It says, have you not heard of uh, iron flow battery? It contains no toxic elements and uses an electrolyte consisting of iron, potassium, chloride, and water. It offers duration of full power of 10 hours and more uh, and a design life of 25 plus years. 
the VRB is not the only flow battery available in Africa. It's from Chris Hubert. Over to you, Chris. Yeah, uh, uh, Chris uh, Hubert, thank you for the question. Of course, there are a whole multitude of competing technologies and applications and chemistries in the battery storage world. Uh, I, there's such a wide range of competing technologies out there, uh, but I must say that right now, the dominant technology in the large scale, uh, utility scale battery storage uh, world is lithium ion. Now, of course, this may change uh, and, and, and who knows uh, what the winners are going to be in the future. Uh, but as I've said before, uh, there are horses for courses and different chemistries and different uh, technologies in the, in the storage market, not just in the battery storage market, have different uh, strengths and weaknesses and application areas and niche markets. We've heard about supercapacitors. They have a certain niche. Uh, flywheel storage has a certain niche. Uh, lithium ion is very suitable for, for uh, mobile applications like electric vehicles. Uh, so uh, I, I, I've heard of these and, and there are many of them and, and, and I'm sure we'll hear more to come in the future. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question, uh, which says, uh, could you please elaborate on the combined levelized cost of electricity from renewables plus battery versus the levelized cost of electricity of an efficient coal supplied power before carbon taxes? I'm not sure why before carbon taxes and not after carbon taxes, because carbon taxes are an important cost item, but nevertheless, that's the question. Also, declining coal demand globally, uh, the price of coal would probably be declined much faster than the decline in the construction of renewables. Could you give your views on the future levelized cost of electricity from coal versus renewable and battery, given this, dyna this dynamic as well? Well, I think we haven't heard from Crescent uh, and perhaps Crescent would like to weigh in here on a question that really is trying to suggest that the declining cost of coal on global markets is going to make coal more attractive uh, than the cost of electricity from renewables plus battery storage. What's your comment on that, Crescent? Okay, fine. Yeah, let me yeah let, let me just give my view on that one. Um, of course, like in terms of uh, in terms of um, coal. Uh, my view, of course, I mean, the whole thing is about the investment um, that, of course, is going to the different technologies and and the decline in costs in terms of uh, wind, solar PV and storage is starting now to actually be very competitive compared to coal. I mean, although the, the cost of coal may be at an international level could be lower, but to put up a coal plant, of course, looking at all the other regulations that have come into play in terms of um, the environmental um, issues that you have to comply with, of course, it, um, it definitely will make it difficult in terms of being competitive against uh, wind, wind and, and, and solar. I mean, with wind and solar, we know they're already cheaper. And when storage, of course, reaches like uh, those uh, competitive level as well, um, there is no, there is no doubt that, of course, I mean that would be what the future energy system should actually be comprised of. Yeah, thank you, Crescent. And uh, while you're still on the line, stay on the line, please, Crescent, because there's another question here that I think you could uh, handle very uh, adequately. Uh, Jan Lo Engelbrecht asks, which criteria have been used to establish the solar and wind potential areas in South Africa by the CSIR? Did it include, for example, factors like the cost of land uh, or land owned by government, which might uh, uh, come at a lower cost? Uh, but uh, yeah, can you give us your thoughts on the wind and solar potential of, 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 the, uh, you know, of South Africa? And I do know that the CSR have done a lot of studies uh, in this regard uh, and that there was research done at 100 meters above the uh, above ground level, which showed that South Africa's wind potential was truly exceptional and something like 60 percent of the land mass of south africa could deliver capacity factors of greater than 35 percent which is really remarkable in global terms so can you comment on this resource the wind and solar resource of south africa uh, crescent yeah um the wind and solar resource study for for south africa of course it was done by the csir as we're coordinating the work 
but of course the work was basically being done for the, the Department of um, uh, Department of uh, uh, Environmental Affairs at the time, and now called DEF. Um, and the study basically took into account all the different what we we'll call exclusion criteria that you could think of in terms of land ownership in South Africa. It took into account all the impacts in terms of environmental limitations that have to be looked into, uh, looking at, um, of course, uh, all participation from the different stakeholders around the country, from the different um, either lobby groups or NGOs that basically push their certain agendas in terms of um, land usage within their jurisdictions. So all those aspects were taken into account in developing uh, that potential for the renewable energy development zones. And it's like a government div driven initiative. Of course, the CSIR is um, uh, 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 driving the work for, for them. And and all, all those aspects were, were taken into account. But um, if you have to look at land ownership, of course, it will be land ownership in terms of ownership of the plants itself when they are being built. Of course, that aspect comes later on because uh, these zones basically are created to provide easy access for developers into those areas in terms of permitting and also easy access in terms of accessing the grid to be able to put up their plans in those areas. But of course, the aspect of uh, negotiating for the land in those areas, that is a next step that will definitely follow what needs to be done. Yeah, but, but in terms of the wind and resource uh, studies uh, that have been done for, for South Africa, similar to what Clyde has mentioned, it's all been based on data that actually anyone can be able to access. If you go to Wind, Art, wind uh, Atlas South Africa WASA on the internet, if you Google it, you can be able to get data there that it basically can show you uh, the um, availability of wind, especially in terms of solar PV, uh, South Africa, I mean, there are just no, 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 no limitations there. And uh, if you have to look at the days when the sun does not shine, yeah, in South Africa is quite rare. I mean, although it can be localized, but if you look at the country as a whole, even a study was done by ESCOM looking at uh, cloud cover impacts for solar PV, and that study basically has shown that South Africa does not have a problem around that. So, and the, the one which we've done from the CSR side was looking at both wind and solar combined and both studies have like really given good facts, which actually now have assisted in the modeling of the IRP, which now is very aggressive on wind and solar PV based on actual data that is based on South African information. Thank you. Thank you, Crescent. And now over to Tabang for the next two questions. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so um, there is a question here that uh, was actually addressed to Crescent and Clyde from Dirk de Vos, saying, "Guess a no, no regret. Uh, sorry, a guess a no regret. Not clear what it means. Uh, the two gigawatt emergency procurement is about procuring gas fired capacity and mostly used um, as picker or batteries for gas to be viable." It needs to supply a minimum amount of gas kg and um, a whole gas infrastructure, LNG trains, the deliquification pipelines, as well as minimum uh, with, through, uh, throughput of actual gas. Slides, uh, talks and slides do not use gas at all. Can we reconcile this? Um, yeah, also maybe slide, would you like to start? I think some people on this, on uh, listening to this, will be aware that I'm not a great fan of the current risk mitigation independent power producers procurement program, because it's uh, it doesn't take full advantage of our national assets, the grid and our underutilized pump storage, and these far more elegant ways of meeting our current energy crisis. Sorry, I've been kicked off again. Are you still I can on? hear you. OK, well, let me come in here while we're waiting for Clyde. Uh, I, a little bit of a counterpoint to Clyde. Um, I've been speaking to a, a person who really understands power systems very well and also understands uh, battery energy storage. And I'm, back markets, I'm sorry, I got kicked off or I got dropped off, but 
Uh, do you want me to continue, Chris, with my monologue? Just, or? I'll, I'll fire, let me finish, and then we'll over to oh. you. Yeah, so right. I, I'm hearing that the, 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 the scale of battery storage deployment that Clyde is proposing is not practical. In, uh, in practical terms, and I would this I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate, Clyde, uh, that 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 your your projections for the amount of battery storage in South Africa are simply uh, unrealistic in terms of the practicalities of not only South Africa but the international battery storage market, and that there will be a, a need for gas uh, as a transitionary technology uh, going forward uh, for still uh, many years to come. Uh, that's what another expert says, and I'm very interested to hear what you have to say. Okay, just very quickly, we're lucky that for a couple of years we can go easy on batteries because we have a huge amount of underutilized pump storage that currently sits within ESCOM's asset base. So I'm talking my battery build kicks off at one gigawatt, four gigawatts an, uh, uh, hours a year, increasing by 10% per year. So by 2030, we would have put in uh, about 10 times as much storage as is currently in the RP. Uh, so it's not a it's not a huge amount by 2030. By 2040, we would have quadrupled that number. So we we we're looking at approximately we're looking at something that's very manageable and that would attract a huge amount of investment interest. The 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 the, the key question here is that. If we're going to, and we are going to, convert from baseload coal and various other things to renewables, we need that storage. And that's why if you look at the last slide in my presentation, or the second last one, it shows that there's a buildup of battery storage on an annual basis. I'm not talking about doing four gigawatts a year for the, I'm, I'm talking about starting on one gigawatt and it's very doable. Uh, I think currently ESCOM are putting in half a gigawatt through the World Bank. Thanks, uh, Clyde. Tabang, do you want to handle one more question uh, before we conclude? I think I think there were two questions in one. Uh, the one was talking around the, they wanted some clarification on the no regret statement. I think it was you, uh, Crescent, who may have made that, uh, unless I've got it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one who made it. Actually, that was like an extract from the IRP. And um, and I would imagine they made that statement uh, basically considering that gas will be a flexibility option in terms of blending the IRP going forward. So they were saying, well, if we invest in gas, looking at the uptake of renewable energy in terms of VRE going forward, and then gas will be a no regret option because with uh, VRE, high shares of VRE will need gas, will, will need flexibility, and will also need storage. And my view always has been, the issue is flexibility is a no regret option, whatever that flexibility is. So if it comes from gas, or maybe if it comes from other technologies that maybe have to do with batteries that provide the same type of flexibility, so be it. So we should not be boxed to technologies. Yeah, but I think it was done in that context. Thanks. Yes, um, colleagues, um, we've run out of time and there's still a thousand questions. Oh, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but there's still a lot of questions there. Uh, unfortunately, we do have a cutoff point and this is it. Um, at this point, I wish to just thank all the participants on the panel uh, from Mr. Mushwana, Mr. Sessa, Mr. Fredo, Mr. Melinson, and, of, and my good old uh, co-presenter Chris Yelland for a job well done. And again, apologies for a little glitch that we had a bit earlier in the day. And behind the scenes, our great producer, Mr. Johnny Dazel and Tula Zamini for the coordination. Just as I wrap up, wrap up I just wish to um, remind you of the um, next upcoming energy and ICT dialogue. Uh, the last one for 2020, which should be on the 10th of December 2020 at uh, uh, midday until this time, half past two. And we'll be talking broadening access to the Internet in South Africa with a focus on infrastructure investment in South African municipalities. Uh, we have a confirmation of speakers from the Deputy Minister of the of COCTA, which is Mr. Park Stau and Professor Brian Armstrong 
from Vets uh, Business School, um, and uh, Ms. Catherine Kaufman from NetBank, um, who heads the Infrastructure, Water and Telecommunication, and also Alan Not Craig Jr., a founder of Project Isizwe in the city of Twani. Um, we'll also be looking at some of the questions that are there and uh, we'll try and, and, and also send uh, some answers as and when we can do through the medium here. Otherwise, we shall be sending through a report and, uh, and uh, the presentations to all the people who have uh, participated today. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank you for your time and I hope to see you again next time on the 10th of December. Have a great day. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much.